Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's Belonging Interview Series by Imperial Lewis One. Um, it's our candid interview series looking at individuals from the BAME community and hearing about their experiences. And this week, you know, I'm really excited about the fact that we've got Lisa Phillips. And Lisa Phillips is a is the co-chair of ABLE. And I'm gonna ask her to expand upon that in a minute. And she's also a senior HR manager at Imperial College. So Lisa, it's really good to have you here this 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 more this afternoon. All right. Um, it's wonderful. What I suppose one of the things I'm I'm really interested in is about your your backstory, because I know everyone has a, a, a good story to tell. But could you tell us a little bit about your early experiences, right, and kind of like how you've got to the position that you're in currently? Okay, um, I'm actually a strategic HR partner. St uh, sorry, that's... Uh, that's fine because that was, we went, we did a restructuring last year, so we changed into a new role. Right. Um, I will start saying I've been with the college now for 35 years. Ooh. Right. Um, <laughs> I know when I say that, people are like amazed, but um, I came pre merger so i was at the royal postgraduate medical school right okay and um that's based at hammersmith and then we were taken over by imperial college so right. i was qpd right um i i could say that i had when i started i started as a level i would say it now it's a level 1a right so i came in at a as a assistant yeah. Um, working for um, the HR director that was based at um, the War Post Group, Ms. Hammersmith. Yeah. And um, I have been I had basically taken on different roles. And when we merged with um, the when we merged with Imperial College, I had a manager that believed me and basically said, you know, you're wasted here. Yeah. You need to start moving, thinking about moving to other sites. Yeah. And so one of the sites that they moved me to was um, Charon Cross. And from there, I've actually worked now in different roles, but I've worked at every campus. So I've been at St. Mary's, Royal Bolton, Char Charon Cross, and then South King. Wow. But, so um, when I say 35 years, I, I suppose it's quite... It's, I think people are like, oh my God, they're alarmed that when I say 35, but I've worked in different roles, Yeah. you know, so I've worked my way up. So yeah. I'm now um, a student HR partner right? and I cover the whole of FOBI, which is finance, estates, ICT, yeah. campus services. Yeah. And then I also cover the business school. Wow. So I have quite a big remit. Yeah, a massive portfolio. Could, yeah. <laughs> could, just before we go into there's there's a number of facets which which I want to investigate. Did you always kind of like envisage yourself going into like the role that you're in? So when you were growing up, was it something that you thinking about where you are now? Is that somewhere where you thought you could have got to when you were growing up? No. So I'm. Um... I'm, I'm, when I, I would say I, I struggled a bit in school. Right. I wasn't one of the things that I was going to think I was going to go to university. Never really mm -hmm. entered my mind. Mm -hmm. But I can remember when a, a teacher, and this teacher said to me, well, you're not going to matter much. I can see you work in the shop. And that quite annoyed me when she said it. Yeah. And um, I decided I was going to do typing. So then I went and did um, did a typing course, business studies. I got yeah. I got a distinction in that. Yeah. And I went into working in estate agents. Right. And when I was working in estate agents, I saw this advert, and I didn't even know what it says something about HR, but yeah. I didn't know what HR was. Right. Okay. All it was, it just seemed quite an interesting job, and I applied for the job, and I got it. Fantastic. And it's when I got it, then I realised, oh, my God, this is quite interesting. You know, it's working with people. And I like working with people. Yeah. And then I thought, 
I can do quite a lot in this role. Yeah. So when I was based at the War Post Medical School, it is then and I was working with a manager and then I got to know more about what HR involves. Yeah. That's when I became interested. So I kind of like fell into it. I wasn't, it wasn't something I was looking for, yeah. but I've been in it for so long now and I've decided, and I like it. So if I didn't enjoy it, I would have left. Yeah. But I do enjoy the role. Yeah. I enjoy the variety of work. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I suppose when I look back on it, this wasn't, it was a, it was it wasn't mapped out. Yeah. But in a way that's good. Yeah. I didn't really need it to be mapped out. But I do I do remember the teacher, and I know this is a really funny story, but I remember going back to the school. So my sons went to the same school. Right, okay. And I remember going back and seeing the teacher. And I went to her and I said, I don't think you remember, but you once said to me that you only could see me working in the shop. And now I'm actually in HR and I hold a, a really good position. And I think she was quite shocked. She goes, no, it wasn't me. And I said, well, it was. But I said, in a way, it was a good thing when you said that because it actually made me think, well, I'm going to do something with my life. I'm not going to be just another number. Yeah. So it kind of like, I was quite... In a way, I was thanking her. I wasn't saying it in a bad way, but I wanted to say, in a way, you saying that pushed me. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, there's a saying which I always think of, and when you said that, it was come, someone might say, she was saying that to you, but actually you took it to be for you, if that makes sense. When two becomes four, someone yeah. might say something to you, but you've used it to make it for you, to make it something which has made you motivated you to, 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 to move forward and upwards. Yeah. And I also like the idea, it, the, the contrast which you painted, which was, there was the one teacher who said, you know, I only see you being, working in, in the shops, right? And they, then you had your, your boss, when you got to the HR department saying, you can do so much more. So you've got the contrast in one who believed and one who just won't well, now, now I can't see any potential there. And I think that that's a, a, a brilliant illustration that you've given us there to start off with. And I'm sure, I'm sure that within the strategic role which you have, that I, I suspect you're more of the latter than the former, right? Someone who's encouraging <laughs> and having spoken to you, I'm pretty sure that, that that's, 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 who you are, that's who you are. I also want to just, think about kind of like the position that you hold at Imperial, because although we've said that you're the strategic um, partner, you hold other, um, other titles as well. Could you just elaborate and illustrate some of those for so, us? I, I probably started as a clerical assistant coming in, and then I became office manager in, at Hammersmith. I've then become a HR advisor. Now to me, no, I was a HR administrator and then I became a HR advisor. Now for me to be the HR advisor was a big stepping stone. So you're now going out and you're working closely with managers. But I think the biggest change is when I remember it is when I applied for a HR manager's role and um, they believed in me. And I, I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I did well at the interview, but I did because when I got the job, I burst into tears. <laughs> and I remember bursting into tears because the manager said, but you did so well. And I'm like, really? And it was a tears of joy, Yeah. you know, um, because to me, having where I start, started mm -hmm. and then to become the HR manager, managing a big remit, Mm -hmm. I thought that was an uh, amazing achievement yeah. for myself. So that's why I burst into tears. And yeah. I've never told anybody that I burst into tears, actually. <laughs> but what I did, I remember when she said, you got the job, and I just cried. Yeah. And it was tears of joy. Yeah. And that, to me, um, showed me how far I had come. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I suppose when I became the HR manager, um, so was, there was me as the HR manager and then I had a senior HR manager. And then when she went on maternity leave, 
um, the director, um, Louise, came and said, well, we think you can do that. You can do the role of the scene. We're not going to bring anyone in. You will manage. We think you need, you, we give you the support, but you will do the work. Yeah. You know, so they didn't actually appoint a senior. Yeah. Um, and we became the seniors. Yeah. Yeah. So there was two, me, me and myself and my other colleague, we yeah. became the senior HR manager. And again, that was another turning point. Yeah. Because they didn't have to do that. And I think they put a lot of trust in me to say, well, you can do this. Yeah. So then um, when the manager came back from this as uh, for maternity, we became her peers. Okay. It was, we didn't actually end up, we, she, they did a restructure, but in the way what ended up happening is we became seniors. Right. Okay. In that role. So I have to thank, I have to think, I have actually, I've been fortunate to have managers that believed in me. Right. Yeah. You know, and they the ones, they're the ones that push me on. Yeah. So if I think if you've got someone that you can look up to and that is willing to invest in you, makes a big difference. Yeah. I just happen to have I can name three managers. There was Louise Lindsay. I mean she, she's to me, to be honest, a lot of the things that happened to me, she I have to thank her for because she right. does help me out. It's Anne Kelly, that's another one. He's doing head of employee relations now. Mm -hmm. She's given me lots of opportunity. And there was a lady called Julie Brown, who was the first person that when I was at Hammersmith and I was working, she's the one that said, you're wasted here and you need to move yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. So when I, because I had those three people, I think that's why I am today. today. Yeah. There's, I, I, I love that, the fact that you've acknowledged the progression which other people have, or the potential other people have seen in you. But you know, sometimes um, people see potential and we refuse to believe it, if that makes sense. Mm. But I'm so glad that you you believed in yourself when other people told you, you know what, you can do a lot more um, and open the doors for you. I think that's that's excellent. But I know that I'm interrupting your story because you've got other- No, 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 you know. <laughs> which you, you have. Um, so could you elaborate on some of those as well? Sorry, what was that? So, so I know that you've got other hats because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see. All right. So yeah. why did I became co-chair of ABLE? So yeah. this, is, this is quite personal to me. So when I was um, about five years ago. Can you just explain? Because I know what ABLE is, but could you just explain to. So ABLE, it's, um, it's a support network. Yeah. And it's for people, it's not just for people with disability, it's people that are interested in supporting disability causes, issues, raising awareness. And um, we, I'm a co-chair with Adrian Manning, right. and we basically are trying to raise the profile of disability awareness. Right. And helping staff, you know, being a support for staff if they've got issues, being a support, being a friend, basically. And so our network, it is quite small. I'm not saying it's a big network, but I do think we have made strides in coming on. I do think we are more knowing, people know more about ABLE now. Mm -hmm. When I first heard about ABLE, there was no posters, there was nothing about it. Mm -hmm. But I think we have moved it forward quite a lot. But the, my, the idea is able, it's a, to me, it's a support network for not for disability, but to, it's about raising awareness and it's quite close to me. And there's a reason why I did it. Uh -huh. So about five years ago, yeah. um, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the reason why I decided to do be able. It was because I did a caliber. So mm -hmm. Calibre is people that have got disability, you know, um, talking about barriers, mm -hmm. um, raising awareness, and what you can do for yourself, you know, believing in yourself. Mm -hmm. And when I did the Calibre show, um, with, um, the program, yeah. what was interesting, somebody came and talked about ABLE. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I heard of it. Yeah. And that kind of roided me and I work in HR. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't even know much about ABLE. Mm -hmm. 
So I said, oh, I like to get involved in that. And the per the chair was stepping down. Mm -hmm. And then I asked um, Kenny whether or not if I could be a co-chair. You know, I didn't... Um, First of all, I think it's because I was HR, they thought there might be a conflict, but I was like, well, this is quite personal because I think I could offer quite a lot. Yeah. And so that's how I became the co-chair of Able. Could, 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 could you just elaborate a little bit more about the kind of like, you said five years ago, you got diagnosed with, with MS, right? And clearly it is personal to you. Can you give our listeners a little bit of an insight into the process to get to that diagnosis. What happened to you? What was it that that, that you noticed that, that caused the, the, the change? Um, I think how it all started, I kind of, I, when I think back on the time, I actually do know when it actually started. I used to walk every day through the park, High Park, from Paddington Station to work. And I'm always, if you see me on campus, I'm always running around, yeah? And then what happened when I walked through the park one day, I couldn't feel my feet. So I'm walking, but I couldn't feel them. But if it thought nothing of it because the weather was cold and I thought, well, you know, it's, it's not really a problem. But then that feeling kept happening. And I go to my doctor and the doctor basically said, oh, it's, it's a minor problem. It will go away after a while, but it never, and it just started getting worse and worse. But what actually, while, while, what I did notice is that I was at work and someone said, why are you limping? Because I didn't realise I was limping. And then it sort of, it crept up on me. So I would, I would say over a year, I started slowly, my mobility started slowly get affected, started to limp, can't feel my feet. And then I'm having to go to all these hospitals. I, I must have gone to about five different quite hospitals physio, everything they did. But I think what actually happened, and I never kind of told any of the story, I went to Dubai and um, we walked, we were walking around and I couldn't walk, I stopped. And I remember saying to my son, I can't move. And I couldn't, I just couldn't move. My legs couldn't move. And um, I remember having to get a taxi back to the hotel. And so when I came back to England, I went back and said, I think there's something really wrong. Yeah. And again, I was, they kind of like said, no, it's, it's not that there might be something wrong with your knee. So they, they did a, a, a little keyhole surgery on my knee. Yeah. But that, when they did that keyhole surgery, I didn't, I didn't, it didn't improve things. It just made things worse. Yeah. But then I, st I was still able to walk, don't get me wrong, I'm still walking, but I was having problems every time I'm walking or I used to stop and then couldn't walk. Yeah. But the worst thing happened is when I was running for a train and as I ran for the train, I jumped on the train, but I fell down the side. Yeah, because and you- And when I went down, yes, yeah, so I went between the chain, <sighs> fell down and then all these, all the, I remember people screaming and they had to pull me up. Mm. I didn't feel myself all. Mm. And that's when I went back and I said, no, there's something wrong. That mm. shouldn't have happened. I didn't even feel myself all. Yeah. So really, fast forward of over about a year and a half, I now, my mobility is getting worse. Yeah. But I still don't have an diagnosis. And then what happened, it was Christmas in January 2015. I remember... It was probably on the 3rd of January. I was at home. I got up and I thought, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what I did. I managed to get in my car and I went to my doctor. Mm -hmm. And I remember the going in and the doctor says, no, she said, oh, you've got to come back to get an appointment. And I said, no, I can't. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to have to sit here and wait. I, mm -hmm. can't, I can't physically move. Mm -hmm. And then the doctor came out and said, walk to him. And I walked towards him. He said, you've got to go straight to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And that's when I knew something was serious, but I think he knew what was wrong with me. Mm -hmm. He didn't tell me, he just said, you need to go straight to Charing Cross. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to Charing Cross and I went into accident emergency, they, that's when I first heard the word MS. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't know what MS was then. It's really yeah. weird. You know, someone's yeah. saying you've got MS and I'm thinking, what's that? What I kept thinking, is that wheelchair? 
yeah. it's like someone going to have to be in a wheelchair. I didn't really know, understand when they were saying it. Um, but I was in hospital for four weeks, over four weeks. And then I was, I was diagnosed with MS. So I'm, I'm just wanting to kind of like, at that point where you got that diagnosis, leading up to it, you were kind of like feeling that something's not right. That's what motivated you, motivated you and drove you to get to the, to the doctor to say, this isn't right. So how was that making you feel overall? And when you got that diagnosis, how did that make you feel? Um, actually, how did it actually make you feel? In the beginning, I, I kind of like, when I was told, it's, it's, it's really weird, it's a weird feeling. When they said to me, when I saw the doctor walking towards me, I actually thought they would come to tell me I was going to die. Right, right, right. Yeah, I know that sounds awful, but that's what I thought they were coming. But right. when they came and said, we've got a diagnosis and you've got MS, I felt relieved. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, okay, I've got, I've got MS. And it didn't really dawn on me at that moment. The only thing I was thinking, how, how am I gonna, how am I gonna get to work? Or am I gonna be able to work? How am I gonna pay my mortgage? Yeah. That was what I started to think. So I went into overdrive. Mm -hmm. And I remember that after that happened, I phoned, I then sent a text to my boss, which was Louise. Mm -hmm. But then her text back kind of like reassured me, it's like, it doesn't matter what the diagnosis is, whether it's, you know, if he was there, yeah. You know, you still got a job, don't worry about it. Yeah. And then it can't, I, I calmed down then. Yeah. So in the beginning, I will say I was quite, not angry, mm -hmm. but more, I don't need anyone's help. I could do this myself, wow. you know, so when, and I think that made people feel a bit awkward because some people didn't know how to approach me, mm -hmm. you know. So when I came back to work, they were like, oh my God, you know, mm -hmm. someone's like, came up and said, we're so sorry to hear about it. Why are you working? Or, you know, should you not be taking medical retirement? Mm -hmm. And you've got others who just didn't say a word to me, didn't know what to right. say. Right. You know, everybody was reacting differently. And I think I was quite defensive then. Right. But then after maybe, I don't know, I've when I see other people with MS, I don't actually think I'm in the worst, I don't think I'm in a bad position. Right, okay. Yeah, I've seen people with MS that have gone blind, that yeah. can't work. Yeah. I've, I've, seen, I've seen different strands of it. And I have MS, but I have it to my legs. Yeah. I just can't walk. Yeah. yeah. I can't walk. I know that in the reality of it, I will probably just end up in the wheelchair full time. Yeah. But it, that doesn't worry me at the moment. It doesn't worry me. Yeah. Because now I have a wheelchair. When I go out, I use a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, I still can walk. I walk with a frame, yeah. you know. Um, I'm able to, when I'm at work, I'm, I'm scooting around, so they got me a scooter at work. <laughs> <laughs> so I am I can function, yeah. you know. So yeah. um, I've come a long way. I don't now think, I don't look at my disability as a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's what, that people, there's worse than people that have got worse conditions than me. Yeah, yeah. That's how I, that's how I look at it. Yeah, there, there was something which you said which kind of like resonated, which was when you spoke about mm -hmm. people's re reactions to you, okay? The fact that when you came back in, there was a multitude of different reactions. Some people wouldn't say anything. Other people were kind of like, oh, we're so sorry. Others were suggesting, why don't you take retirement? How, do, how did that kind of like make you feel in terms of, I know I've got I've got a disability, but my my mind is still functional, etc. How did that make you feel? And, and what advice might you give to someone in that position? I think in the beginning, I I'm kind of if people know me, I'm quite forward in saying what I see. If yeah. you say something and I don't like it, I will probably tell you why. Um, I think at the time. I think it's all about, again, that's about disability awareness. Mm -hmm. It's about sending the message, sending the right message. So if I said, if someone, if someone said to me, oh, Lisa, um, you know, why didn't you take, med why didn't you take medical retirement? I would, I say to them, well, why should I? Um, you know, what is it that I can't do? I can't, my feet, I, have, I might not be able to walk, but 
in terms of my ability in being able to do the job, I can still do. So it's actually just educating the person. Mm -hmm. So I didn't take it, I wasn't angry. I suppose it's just getting used to it. And I understood why people were asking me that because remember, I've worked for college for now 35 years. People have seen me running about and now they see me in a wheelchair or they see me in a scooter. So it's all about educating. So I don't, like now, I don't really, I don't mind if they if they ask me. I will rather they do because I'm actually telling them something they're learning. Mm -hmm. So I I always say to people that have dis who have got a disability, don't mm -hmm. shy away from it. Mm -hmm. You know, I I'm more that I'm the person that if I could get any sort of support, if I could get access to work and provide me with stuff to help me do my job, I will take that. Mm -hmm. So I, I've, I am actually will reach out. And that's why I want to say when people with disability, there are things that can be done. Imperial have got loads mm -hmm. of um, support resources. You could get access to work. You could get workplace adjustments. There's loads of things you could do, but a lot of people don't want to declare it. And I, that's to me, is quite sad. Okay. I think there's a lot of things out there that we can help support you. That's one of the reasons why I did ABLE because I kind of like think if I if I could show them that I well I get you know the adjustments they made for me, mm -hmm. then I I think they can learn from that and they might think oh well, look look what Lisa gets that's a good thing. Yeah, I suppose another question another question which which kind of like comes to mind is when you when you think about protected characteristics right um which 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 we often hear about you always think about gender race sexuality disability etc now as a black woman how has how has that impacted on on your sense of identity belonging um in in itself this, when you intersect all of the things I think it's I think it's a lot harder. So I am a black woman with a disability. So mm -hmm. I've got three of them. Yeah. Right. And to be honest, it can be very hard. Not I wouldn't say in the college because I don't feel I actually feel I belong in the college. Yeah. I, I've always felt belonged. I don't feel like they're treating me different. Mm -hmm. Um. But it's interesting, I, I can say a story which I, someone, when I remember saying it to the managers, like, when we have meetings, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, you organize a meeting, you, they never really sort of thought about how I was gonna get to that meeting, mm -hmm. or, you know, so they book it, and then they just expect me to get there. Mm -hmm. And I remember going in and saying to the managers, just to let you know, I'm the one that's got the disability, so I, that barrier is, having to get to that meeting at, on that time, you need to make adjustments mm -hmm. for me to get to that meeting. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I think then people now take that into consideration every time they book something with me. Mm -hmm. So that means I have raised that awareness. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna also do the other thing outside. It's not in college. It's when I go out, mm -hmm. I could be going, and I can remember I went out with my sister and I was in a wheelchair and the person came and said to my sister, oh, are you her carer? This is what you need to do. And I said, excuse me, but I can talk. And the person <laughs> said, yeah, but she, your carer, we need to talk to your carer. And I'm like, but why? Yeah. Um, the only issue is, is that I, I'm in a wheelchair, but I can still talk, I can still yeah. function. Yeah. That annoys me because yeah. I think, not because I'm, I, I think one, they probably looked at me in the wheelchair, but also I kind of like thought maybe it, you had to be in that moment. I, I felt it's because I was black yeah. and I probably, they probably felt, well, she's a black woman. She doesn't know what she's doing. Mm -hmm. When I was disabled, I was in the wheelchair mm -hmm. and I was female. And the, yeah. the person that was with me, mm -hmm. they must have thought, well, she could, she, she, she will know. Mm -hmm. I won't know anything. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt. And you, but that does happen quite a few times when I go, especially if I go abroad. It happens mm -hmm. all the time when we go to abroad. Mm -hmm. 
suppose you're, I'm not going to say you're, you're in a unique position, but to, to an extent you are. Um, maybe I might be stepping over, over the line here, but I'm going to ask a question anyhow, right? I hope, forgive me if, if anything. But how do you find that you've been treated differently as a black woman since you've got the disability compared to how you were treated before? Right. Do, do you get my, my question? Yes. Um, yes, I have. Yeah. But I wouldn't say in the context, not at work. I yeah. haven't experienced it. I don't feel I experience myself at work. Mm -hmm. But I have socially. Right, okay. Yeah. I, I, think it, I think it's because the reason why I probably haven't experienced it in the same way, people know who I am. Right, okay. Remember, I've been here a long time, so a lot of the managers I work closely with Ready, know me. They knew me when I was running around, yeah. um, and they know me in the wheelchair. I don't think I don't feel they come to me with they they, they trust me. Yeah, I think I built that relationship a really good rapport with the managers. Mm -hmm. they, they still come to me. They don't see my disability. Mm -hmm. I know they don't because mm -hmm. they ask me to do the same kind of work, ask for the same advice. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they are taking into account my disability, which actually is good for me. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So they make reasonable adjustments, i.e. in terms of planning meetings, etc., like that. But in terms of the way in which they respond to you, there's no difference in the relationship. No. Uh, I, I, I liked what you said there about the fact that building the relationship is quite key. And it's only when, or not only, but when you don't have a relationship, then those physical manifestations may be the ones which become most evident. Um, and people then don't engage properly because of what they see as different, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just ask, Right. Um, I could ask loads of questions, but I'm going to just open it up and see if there's anyone who's listening who also would like to ask a question um, at this time. Otherwise, I will just continue asking you questions, Lisa. Is there anyone? Let me just check the thing. Are there any questions? I think. So I've seen. I've got a, I've got a comment which basically said that they've known you as a strong lady, um, right, um, and that they would not have thrived, um, and that they know that nothing will hold you back. And I can see that definitely. I, I can definitely in the in our conversations which we we've, we've had. I can see that you are a positive, um, positive role model, a positive figure for anyone who wants to know about any issues, definitely you are someone who I would definitely encourage people to talk to. Um, I'm just thinking about some other questions then. In terms of how can we develop that relationship building? Because, um, yeah, how, how, how can we develop that relationship building I, mean, I, um, I don't know, to be honest, I never really sort of, I just work closely with the managers. I think it's the, my nature of my role. And I was assigned, the, the managers I've been assigned to, I think they just put, we just, I, I think over the time, we just built up that relationship as it goes. And I know that they trust me. Mm -hmm. When they ask me to do things, they trust and they know I would try and do my best to deliver the results. Mm -hmm. But that does take time, you know. So I kind of like, I think it's because they, over time, they see how I work and they see how I can deliver and they like that. Mm -hmm. um, but don't get me wrong, there are, there are um, it's not something that just happened overnight. I think it's taken a long time to build up that trust. Mm -hmm. But I do feel my role now, I work with a lot of the senior managers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 
when I think back to myself when I started as a clerical assistant, mm-hmm. and when I look at myself now, it's a big change. It's, it's, it's completely different. With- all right, let me. Uh, I can see that William's got a question, but I, uh, it's something that I just wanted to ask before I ask William to come in with his question. Do you think that you've had to change from your authentic self, or do you think you've had to change in order to um, maintain your position here at Imperial in any way? No. No, okay. And the reason is okay. um, it's what you see, it's mm-hmm. what you get. Yeah? Okay. Um, I'm not, remember, I didn't go to university. Mm -hmm. I probably don't speak posh or anything like that, Mm -hmm. but I am to the facts, you know, so that's how the manager knows me. I I don't think I have to change myself because that's who I am. Mm -hmm. That's what I've I've never changed myself. I'm not, I don't kind of like say I like, no, I just think I am me. This is who okay. I am. Right. One thing I, I am going to say, and I probably should have remembered that, is when I was, um, like I said, I wasn't academically, I didn't go to university or anything like that. Mm-hmm. But then there was something I wanted to do was employment law. Mm-hmm. And I had, again, I managed to have a really good mental tutor mm-hmm. who basically said to me, you can do more than this. Mm-hmm. And he, um, so I did an employment law degree and I got a merit. Fantastic. Now, again, if you think from my past, when I think back myself when I was mm-hmm. at school, to mm-hmm. get the merit, to me, I never believed I could do it, but yeah. I did do it because yeah. I had, again, another good tutor yeah. who helped me. Yeah. You basically said you could do more. It's, it's, I think it's when people say you could do more, then I do more. Yeah. So yeah, that's how I am. So I don't, I don't think I've changed myself, but I do, I do get inspired when people say you could do more. And I think, oh, yeah, can I? And then I think, yeah, well, I'll, I'll give it a go. So I, I do. I, I, listen, you got to get up and go when you got to go. That's what I'm saying. Go, Lisa. That's all. That's, I agree with Sue's. Sue's comment there. Go, Lisa. Definitely. Will, would you like to um, ask your question now, please? Yeah. Hi, um, Lisa. I can see you're held in very um, high esteem. Um, Hi. (laughs) So um, so my question is is about how HR approaches, have they changed? And has your experiences influenced how you might have changed in your approach to doing HR. I mean, maybe just to add on to that, we think that it's um, 25 years since Disability Discrimination Act, seen a lot of changes in race equality law. So actually has approaches to HR and how it's done. Have they changed given you've been there across all that time? Have approaches to HR changed? In um, I would say yes we changed a, a lot and if we, and when i when i think back to when i was the clerical we probably wouldn't even know anything about to do with discrimination that wasn't something on our mind you know but i what i have seen and i'm so impressed actually i've seen it grow and grow and grow and i've seen now the support that's out there. So I kind of like, kind of like think it's a shame more people, what really is upset, it's quite sad is HR help offers a lot. What, how I see what we've grown and what we can offer and what support we can give. It's a shame a lot of people do not declare their disability. Mm-hmm. It's a shame that every time there's something that happens even to do with race, we are always there trying to make, promote it or make it better. That's what I see. Mm -hmm. So do I think how HR has changed? Yeah, but I'm on the journey with HR. Mm -hmm. I think we could do a lot more. You know, there's always always room for improvement, Mm -hmm. but I do think um, we're in the right direction compared to what we were in the years when I started, when it wasn't even heard of, and what we got now, massive, 
it's a massive achievement. And I'm not just saying that because I'm in HR. I'm saying that because I've I've seen it. Okay. I'm I'm just I'm just I think I've just seen a comment in um, the chat which I probably should have been aware of and I probably was but it just slipped my mind that you also got um a college recognition medal is that right no oh. <laughs> yeah I I I was um nominated actually it was a surprise I think it's in 2018 yeah um yeah I was nominated um for a recognition award for the HR contribution. Yeah. And um, again, that was quite, that was a scary moment, actually. I'll tell you why it was scary. Because I never realised when you get the award, you have to go to the Royal Abbott Hall. Right, okay. Um, and also, one thing I didn't realise is that you have to do it in front of all the students. Yeah. On the stage. And... And Louise said to me, oh, well, um, you know, do you want to, I'll help you to go walk up the aisle and then you need to walk on the stage. And I'm like, well, all those people looking at me. I mean, there was thousands of people there. And um, she's like, no, but I will hold on to you. You will not fall. And that's when I was, all I had was I had the sticks, but I, my motor mobility was bad. And I remember coming down the stairs and there was all these thousands of people and they were all on the stage and I had to walk up the, the, the aisle onto the stage. Mm -hmm. And um, I did it, but Louise held onto me so tight. I did it, but actually that was the most scariest moment because all I kept thinking, what if I fall? <laughs> <laughs> but I did it. And again, that was, um, I suppose that is, I never really sort of thought about it when when I got the award. It didn't. I didn't. It it was kind of like, well, I felt wow, because mm -hmm. um, all my family came, my sons came, yeah. and it, so to me, it was a, again, it was a good thing that I achieved. But I never really looked at it. I was like, well, why me? Yeah. But I suppose again, I then I thought, well, yeah, it should be me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I should be proud of it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so it was a it was it was a really nice occasion, which I will always remember. Absolutely brilliant. I I, th I want to end on that note because there was a couple of things which you said which I think are really encouraging, and I suppose sometimes I think people look at HR and they think, hmm, okay, um, but from what I can hear and what I've seen. I th and what you've said, I think we should almost like view HR as someone who, as individuals who actually want to give us a hand up, because that's what it sounded like from what you've said, that your objective is to give people a hand up as opposed to push people down. I don't know, yeah, and, and I think maybe not only in terms of the, and it, it ties in quite nicely with the idea about what you want to do with ABLE, which is about giving people a hand up, giving them the support that they need in order to develop and move forward. So whether or not you have a disability or not, reasonable adjustments will be made. And, yeah. I, think, and I think that's what, um, I'm not trying to advocate for HR, but I'm just, I'm just saying, if that's what we're talking about, human resources, about human development i think if we can get to a position where we can be looking how can we lift each other up from whichever position they currently are in i think we'll all be in a much better place i agree yeah and and that's just come from the discussion that we've had and the things which i've seen and congratulations on that medal you thoroughly deserved it all right thoroughly deserved it <laughs> um is, no, it's been absolutely wonderful. If there was one thing that you would tell your 16-year-old self, what would it be? Um, believe in yourself. Right. Believe in yourself. I mean, to be honest, I, I have to believe in myself in order to do it. Yeah. And also think there are worse things out there. Yeah. This is not the worst having MS. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of like what I 
now realise, yeah. you know, I've got a disability, yeah, but that's it, that's it, I've got a disability, but I'm still functioning. Yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. That's brilliant. I, 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 I'm applauding. It's, it's been absolutely brilliant. And I'm, I know that um, over the next few weeks that it is um, the Disability Awareness Month. And there is. But can I just promote one thing because it Go is ahead. Disability Month. So we are, John Nelson is our sponsor. Right. Um, well, we're not doing it in Disability Month, but we are planning to do a panel. Mm -hmm. and, and it will be John Nelson and it will be Stephen Curry mm -hmm. and Harvey Jan, our director. They will be the panel members and we are going to hold this big function next early February. Fantastic. That's the plan. And the co-chairs are going to be presenting this. Fantastic. So I'm putting it out there. Brilliant. You know what? You let us know when it is and we will promote it on our belonging series again to make sure that everybody knows exactly when it is and that they, we can all join in and celebrate celebrate our differences okay yeah. you know, i've just i've just got a message it's going to go into our newsletter so just keep us informed all thank right? you thank all you right? so i'm going to say thank you again and just let everybody know what will be what's coming up next week so So next week, we will be having Keltner Mystery, who is the Staff Networks Coordinator at Imperial College. I call her our little go-to person, right? So I'm really looking forward to um, speaking with Keltner next week. So please tune in and um, we can have a really good discussion. If you have missed any of the other talks, um, they can be found at our YouTube site. So please go ahead and have a look. If not, please come and join us next week and when we'll be having Kelpner with us. So thanks again. And we hope to see you all back again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.